So I'm going to go ahead and introduce us. I'm Rebecca Schofield, and today I'm here talking with Frank Harrell um, about uh, the International Gay Rodeo Association and um, really just doing a oral history. Today is July 7th. July 7th, uh, 2017. And we're <coughs> in Denver, Colorado. To be very precise, we're at the Jefferson County Fairgrounds in Golden, Colorado, which is just slightly north of Denver. And uh, tomorrow will be the Rocky Mountain Regional, Regional Rodeo. <coughs> Excellent. So, uh, what year were you born? I was born on January 23rd, 1952, in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. And um, what was it like growing up? Small town boy. Rocky Mount at the time had about 25,000 population. Uh, didn't really go very far. I had a walk to school. Um, I don't remember a whole lot about that time in my life. Uh, <clears throat> I am now 65 years old, so it's it's been a while. Uh, it's just little clips and things like that that I remember. Um, can you think of any um, sort of story in particular from growing up? Yeah, I guess a couple. One, which I have been thinking about a lot lately. Uh, people tend to have fetishes. One of my fetishes is rubber hip boots. And I've never quite understood where that came from until recently I remembered an incident. I must have been about four, maybe five, and there was a church a block away from us that was, uh, they had a small, almost just like classroom area and they decided to build their, their chapel. And so I was standing on the, on the side of the street watching the, uh, the construction people digging the, the foundation for the building. And they were pouring concrete from a truck into it at the time, this would have been in the, uh, the mid-1950s, it was most very common that your construction team were all blacks, especially in that part of the country. And uh, you would have one or two supervisors, which would have been white. And they were filling the ditch with concrete. And these construction workers, these black guys, were down in the ditch in rubber hip boots. And most of them had gotten out and there was this one guy and I don't know if he just simply wasn't very smart or whether he was showing off but he stayed in the ditch and he was raking the concrete around his boots <laughs> and somehow that had some sort of a click in my brain and the uh, the supervisor yelled at him and used a few cuss words and said get the hell out of there <laughs> and uh, that was when I turned and, and left but I, I think I was probably right at the chemical point that that had some effect on my biology and that's something I've been thinking about a lot lately as to what I, I think it would make an interesting research project if anybody would take on what causes people to have certain types of fetishes mm -hmm. Cause I think I think just about everybody has one of one sort or another but that's one I remember and um so what did your parents do for a living? My father was a professional portrait photographer, uh, as well as his father. Uh, he had a small business. Uh, my grandfather, and I don't know too much of the story about how he got started in it, but about 1920, he had a studio in Wilson, North Carolina. And for some reason, he was in Rocky Mount for business, and the streets were just jammed with people. The next week, he moved his studio to Rocky Mount. Uh, grandfather died in 1945, and Dad took over the studio. In the late 1950s, it's starting to rain a little bit. In the late 1950s, we went through a recession, and his studio pretty much dried up. He had no, no income. I learned many years later that 
the entire year, and I'm not sure which one it was, the entire year his gross income was $15. He was living off of his life savings, or we were living off his life savings. So he had to do something. So he put out uh, applications to every place he could think of. First one that came through was with the Smithsonian Institution as a photographer. So we moved to Northern Virginia where he started working for them. And that's where he worked for the last 20 years of his life. Lots of interesting stories that came out of that. But, uh, that's, that's what Dad did. Mother was basically a housewife who was not there a whole lot. Uh, she, she was not much of a mother. I didn't really like her that much. She used to use the kids to get at Dad. So it was, he was not a particularly happy household. And did you have siblings? Uh, yeah, I have uh, I have four, two two brothers and two sisters. I'm the oldest. We're having trouble picking up through the. Okay. Um, I I was uh, I came along, and then my next sister came along nine years later, and then they all came about a year and a half apart. So essentially, when I was growing up, I was the person that took care of the family because mother was never around to do it. Of course, dad was working. I hate kids. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think anybody who's listening to this understands what I mean by that. <laughs> that I don't really hate kids. It's just I, no way do I want to have any of my own. You had a lot of experience. Yeah, childhood. exactly. Right. Exactly. Um, and so how long were you in North Carolina? Uh, we left North Carolina when I was 11, so I had my first, my 12th birthday, we were already in Virginia. So I spent, I lived in Northern Virginia from then until 2010 when uh, my partner and myself moved to Colorado. So was there a big change in culture at all between North Carolina and Virginia or landscape? Uh, landscape major change. We moved from um, small single family brick houses to a duplex in, in the middle of Arlington. I, I remember our addresses. We moved from 1316 Hill Street North, in North Carolina to 3213 13th Road South, Arlington 4, Virginia, even before zip codes. <laughs> and I am not superstitious in the least bit, but if I were, with all those 13s in there. <laughs> so we lived there for about two years, and uh, I found out later that both my parents realized I was an un unhappy kid. So we ended up, they ended up, once Dad got better on his feet, we purchased a new house uh, in a suburban neighborhood that was being built. 62, 63, right in that period. I'd have to try to figure out the exact date. But uh, went from basically being in the middle of a, of a metropolis into an area that had lots of trees and open space and, and woods all around. So I, I fell in love with the outdoors. And I enjoyed growing up in that, in that area. What were some of the things you would do outside? Oh, I loved to build trails. We had lots of woods in the area, and I would go out with my rake and build a trail for people to, to walk on. And one of which actually ended up, even after the uh, all the woods were torn down and houses were put in, still is still there as a paved walkway uh, because the position of it was so perfect. It, and it, it goes into a lot of... Uh, wooded areas that uh, into a park area that's, that's right next to those houses. But that was that was my favorite thing to, to build trails. We go camping. We went uh, we went camping a lot up in Shenandoah National Park. And uh, then in 1967 we took our first trip west. That uh, Dad would pile the family into the car. We had uh, 
let's see this dad mom grandma me sally my sister and my latest brother charlie we're all in a, a used black ford middle of july temperature 110 degrees crossing the prairies no air conditioning that was a hot car black <laughs> And uh, our first stop, I think we spent three days getting across the major part of the country, and our first stop was uh, in, uh, up here in, in just west of uh, Denver at Echo Lake uh, at an elevation of 10,000 feet. And I remember Dad telling one story about that trip that Mother kept she had never been west of North Carolina, and she, Dad was going as hard as he could to travel the almost 2,000 miles across here. And she kept saying, slow down, slow down, I want to see the country. Until we got to uh, the Mississippi River, and this was on the, the interstate system when it was brand spanking new. It had only been open a few months. And here was a sign across the top of the road that said, Denver, 500 miles. <laughs> Mother grew up in an area where the next town was three miles apart, and she never bothered. <laughs> she never bothered to complain after that. <laughs> Other thing that was going on was when we were leaving, Dad was shoving blankets in uh, in every nook and cranny of the back of the car he could find, and Mother just couldn't understand why he was putting blankets in the car in the middle of July. Well, that night, up at Echo Lake. We froze our bippies off. <laughs> <laughs>
and I love the shade this gives over my eye. I, I can't go outside without a cowboy hat on or I have problems. Not just because I'm used to it, but because my, my eyes are sensitive to the bright sunlight. Dad being a photographer, when I was a little kid, he used to make reflectors out of a piece of cardboard and aluminum foil. And he would hold it down there and reflect the, the, the light into your face. And he would say, don't squint, don't squint. <laughs> which I couldn't stand not to squint. Uh, so the, the cowboy hat I've worn even when I worked. And along about, I don't know if I think of the, the year, the time is, times have kind of uh, blurred together in the last 20 years. One of the last jobs I had, the lady there started calling me cowboy because I wore the cowboy hat all the time. And the name kind of stuck, and I liked it. So that's that's why people know me as Cowboy Frank. And when I first got involved in web design, uh, I was in the first web, my first personal web page. I started probably about a year after I started web work. And uh, of course, the first website address that I registered was CowboyFrank.net. So. The gay world has grown, has grown to, to, to know me by that name. But it just, it's just, as I said at one point someplace, I could wear the cowboy hats to work. I also like black leather, but I couldn't wear that to work. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> that's part of the way that it goes. Um, so how many of those trips did you take while you were young? How often oh, were you coming out west? Uh, after 67, uh, Dad went out every year until about two years before he died in 83. Uh, I went with him on probably about five of those, maybe six. I'd have to stop and, and really think on it. Um, as I grew up, I had I had to get out and start earning a living for myself, and uh, that's pretty much when that kind of going out with the family kind of faded away because I had to work and I couldn't always take two weeks off in the middle. So Dad was out every year, but uh, I probably missed about four of the trips that he did. What were the dude ranches like? Uh, pretty much what we did uh, most of the time was just simply get a horseback ride. Um, the one one year we actually spent, I think it was three nights at a dude ranch, which is actually up here in the Terriol, called it was called the Terriol River Ranch, which is still there and operating as a dude ranch. Uh, but all the others were just simply a, a, a one-hour horse ride. Uh, which I don't really remember all that much from from that far back, but uh, later on I did get involved with horses quite a bit more. Yeah. Um, what was high school like? High school was kind of interesting. I'm, I've always been technically minded, and I've also been very shy, and it's very difficult to, for me to start or to make first contact to somebody I don't know or some function. But it, I've always, like, Dad was a, uh, he was a professional photographer, but his hobby was movies, eight millimeter movies. And he kept encouraging me to try to get involved in the, the, the motion picture film stuff and equipment that they had at the high school. And finally, one day I worked up the courage to go to the librarian and asked if uh, I could get involved in the working with the AV department. Well, probably about three weeks later, I found myself as the uh, as the president of the AV club for th for the high school, <laughs> and so I was very much involved in, in in that equipment and managing it, taking care of it. We had a number of interesting events that took place. I see one. One that I'm thinking of right at the moment. The way the library was arranged, that you came in through a uh, through the main door of the library, and then to the right was the 
registration desk where you would check your books out, and you'd have to go around the registration desk into another hallway, and that's where the AV stuff was kept. Well, the AV room was always locked, so we would get around there, find the door closed, and have to come back to get the key, and then open it and bring the key back again. And one day I said, what would be an easy way to deal with this problem? So completely illegally, I ran a piece of wire from the light in that room through the ceiling, and I placed a little neon bulb just hanging out of the ceiling uh, next to the entrance. It worked beautifully for about three weeks. Uh, you would know that somebody was already in the room if that light was on. And then it hit the fan. Uh, came out in the school newspaper on the front page, what is this mysterious light that is sometimes on and sometimes <laughs> off? Uh, luckily it didn't get me into any trouble, but they removed that light very quickly, <laughs> which put us back to the problem of having to deal with getting the key. But. Um, had a lot. Of, it had a number of little experiences like that. I, I enjoyed mechanical stuff. I've always been very good with mechanics, which I guess is partly responsible for my talent in uh, computer work. But uh, I got involved with the astronomy club, and we had a planetarium in this high school. It was a small planetarium. Uh, for some reason. During that period, uh, Fairfax County school systems had a superintendent that was real big on astronomy. So Fairfax County actually had nine planetariums in the school system, and one of them was in my school. So uh, I got involved in that. Of course, I liked the machine, machine, and uh, we had a lot of fun with that. But as far as school is itself is concerned, I was not a very good student. I did not like school. I've always had trouble with school and with learning. Uh, I find it pretty easy to learn things if I'm working with it, but I don't learn well from reading books. They do well with me with as, as uh, reference manuals, but not trying to read through something to, 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 to gain knowledge. So I was pretty much a C and D student in school. Uh, going back a few years, and between the first and the second grade, my father taught me how to read. He taught me about the consonants and the vowels and all how they were all pronounced and stuff like that. And when I went into my the first day in second grade, and I remember this very clearly, uh, the teacher would ask questions, and my hand went up for every single one of them. Not one single time did she ever call on me. She called on the people who didn't know the answer. I think her concept was you're going to make the person feel bad, so they're going to try to learn. Well, it backfired with me, and I kind of realized many years later that what it did to me is I said, well, if you're going to be that way, then I'm not going to bother to learn. And it kind of screwed me up the rest of the way through school because uh, I didn't realize that's what was happening at the time. But I think that I've also got some talents, which are, are non-talents, if you call it that, which makes it difficult for me to learn under those conditions. So I was pretty bad in school. I just barely graduated. But I, di I did, eventually, did graduate. But I did not go on to any further education. When uh, you were in high school and immediately out of school, um, was there any sort of, of you know, technical education about computing or computers? Hmm. Computers in school was just beginning to start when I was uh, in, high, in, in uh, senior in high school. Uh, I think that when I was a junior, the school got its first terminal, which I now know was actually being connected to the ARPANET, which was brand new at the time. And uh, they, had, they had a, I don't remember what they called it, but it was a room that, they, that people would go into when they didn't have a class to, to, to attend. And they had this teletypewriter terminal set up in there. And there was a group of about four or five who were big into that. Uh, 
it was way beyond my reach because they wouldn't even let you touch it unless you were a straight-A student at that time. But we did have a connection to the ARPANET in, in my high school. Uh, I didn't start getting involved in computers as, uh, as such until uh, 19, about 1979 or 80, when Radio Shack came out with their second computer. I, I didn't get the first one, but the second one, which was called the Radio Shack Color Computer, was the first one that was available where you didn't have to buy the TV set along with it. So I got my first computer for, I think I paid about $300 for it. Uh, and I could use my own television, because at that time I couldn't afford the, 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 the one that came with the TV. And I learned basic fooling around with that computer, but I didn't really learn it too terribly well because the only storage method that it had was a cassette player or recorder that you would try to store your program on. Half the time it didn't work. So when I tried to reload it, the program didn't reload, so I had to type the whole program in again. <clears throat> uh, so I played around with that for a few years, and uh, eventually, within that period, uh, 1983, I met my life partner. And probably a year and a half after we met, uh, he bought a, an IBM PC for home. He got it part of the project, a uh, work project through the company he was working for at the time. Uh, I think it was something like, uh, you buy it now and if you use it then we'll pay you back for it over a period of a year, something like that. I don't remember exactly what it was. And that's when I actually began to get in, uh, to a certain extent, programming. But it wasn't real deep programming. Jumping forward a, a few years, in uh, 96, 1996, uh, I was a volunteer at Manassas National Battlefield Park, which is the first major land battle of the American Civil War in Northern Virginia. The park was only 11 miles from where I lived, so it was a convenient place to be volunteering in. After a couple of years, well actually I started there uh, as their volunteer computer specialist because they needed somebody who knew something about computers. When I started, I said, I don't do Windows. And they said, no problem, we don't have any Windows computers. Well, about two years later, they started getting Windows computers, so I had to start learning that. But uh, I had been there for a few years doing this, and uh, one day I brought in our notebook computer to show them this new thing that we had just gotten hooked up to at home called the Internet. And I was you know, showing them how websites worked and stuff like that. And I typed in nps.gov, which is nationalparkservice.gov. And to my surprise, the page popped up. I found out later that the site had only been online for two days. So it was very <laughs> coincidental that it happened at that time. Uh, the page was very, very simplistic. It was just simply a, a scanned picture of the, of the Yosemite brochure with a little bit of information about the park service and uh, a contact for the webmaster. So I was in the park. I had a park or a government email address. So I, I emailed the webmaster and said, this is fantastic, but you need more information up here. Uh, I'm a volunteer at one of the parks. So he wrote back and said, how did you like to get your park online? And that's when I had learned, I had to learn something called HTML, which I'd never heard of before. I went down to my local computer store and uh, asked them, what, what do you have in that? And said, well, everything we've got is over here in the book department. Because at that time, there were no programs to create web pages. You typed it in manually. They said, except yesterday we got in this program. It's a plug-in from Microsoft Word, which allows you to save Word documents as a web page. It cost me 100 bucks. So I bought it, took it home, found out my copy of Word was pirated. So, it wouldn't work. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to go back out and buy a copy of Word for another 100 bucks. Started playing with it and very quickly realized the pages weren't coming out the way I wanted them to. So I got to understand what's going on in the background. So I started looking closer. 
And I realized that it was a lot easier to write the code than it was to try to fight with these WYSIWYG programs, which uh, I still write raw code. Uh, I do not use WYSIWYG programs at all. And uh, so I started putting together a page for the part. And it took me about three months before I got something that the, the, the superintendent liked. And it got posted. I've, I've got, I actually figured out the date that it got posted recently. I've got it written down someplace. And um, it went from there. And uh, so I continued working at the park with that for a few more years until uh, near the end of 1999. We were, the country was, or actually the world was going into a situation where uh, they were concerned when the year, the calendar changed to 2000 that computer systems were going to crash because of the way the dates were written. And so there was this big push on getting any problems that might be fixed. We had a meeting which was called by the local computer people for the region. So uh, I showed up for that meeting, and my supervisor said, you weren't invited, go away. And the, the guy in charge of the meeting said, we are going to, you know, this is what we're going to be talking about, so I stayed. We got into a serious argument about that, because she didn't want me coming to meetings that I wasn't invited to. Well, it, the, the resulting me, of me not attending other meetings uh, ended up causing me a lot of hassles when, like contractors unplugged server equipment and stuff like that. Uh, so between that and uh, several other things that occurred at the same time, I left the park very upset. And uh, a few months later, a fellow that I had met had a, an organization which was connected to the park. And he came to me and said, would I create a web page for them? And that was the start of my uh, career or a retired career of developing websites for nonprofits. I had uh, in 1996, early 96, I was subscribed to a gay news uh, gay magazine. I've forgotten exactly which one it was now. I think it was Drummer magazine. Uh, and in 96, there was an article, not an article, an advertisement for a magazine called Roundup. I looked at that and here was an advertisement for Gay Rodeo. Well, we had already scheduled uh, some vacations and I wasn't able to make the Gay Rodeo that was occurring in Washington, D.C. at that year, but we did make the one in Denver. So in 1996, Denver Rodeo was our first gay rodeo. We came to that one and we continued going to every one we could get to, especially since there was one in our own backyard in Washington, D.C. Um, eventually in 2000, a fellow that, because of my website, occasionally I got people who would email me saying, hi, here's a picture of me. Put it on your website if you want, whatever. And uh, I had about 10 or 15 of these. And I decided to create what I called buddy galleries of people who had sent pictures to me. And so I contacted these people saying, is it OK if I, if I put your picture up? And do you have an email you want me to put next to it, and so forth? Well, one guy who had sent me this picture, his name was Terry. Uh, he wrote back and said, no problem, here's the email. By the way, if you're ever in Fort Valley, stop by and maybe we can go for a trail ride. And he was into horses. And uh, he was also involved in the rodeo. And uh, maybe have a picnic or something like that. Well, I found out later that he thought I lived in Texas and he'd never see me. But as it turned out, he was actually only 75 miles from where I lived. So I contacted him back and uh, Went up there, we, we, we visited a little bit, and then, then arranged to come back in a couple of weeks to actually go for a horse ride. Now, I was not very much very good horse rider, but uh, it was a lot of fun. I loved it. And uh, he kept encouraging me to go get some horse riding lessons. 
you know, as I got, you know, let, let me let me back up on that a little bit and go back to my original story. Well, Terry was involved in the Atlantic States Gay Rodeo Association. He was a member and he competed. He managed in, I think it was 2000, he got me involved. I became one of the stable volunteers. But when I got there with my camera, which is also the first year I had a digital SLR, he didn't put me to work in the stables. He said, you go around shooting pictures. So rather than simply being able to take pictures from the stands, I got to go behind the scenes and take pictures everywhere. Boy, did I shoot a lot of pictures that year. And those pictures went onto my website. Now, after, I guess it was another year, Terry made the proper connection because I've always been very shy about trying to make an initial contact. I wanted to do a website for Gay Rodeo and he made the connection and I went to see the guy who had been doing the website and uh, basically he turned it over to me. So that's when I created the Atlantic States Gay Rodeo Association's website as it, as it is still there right now uh, as of this year. In 2006, I went to, well, I had actually gone to several of the con uh, IGRA conventions at this point. In 2006, Brian Helander was elected as the president. And again, I was shaking like a leaf because I was s scared making this first contact. After convention, I went up to him and said, I'd like to do the website. And I told him that my ASGRA website had won the website award the previous year. And he said, come see me when I become, get into, into office. And that's when I became the webmaster for IGRA. Uh, in between then and now, I have also been the webmaster for several other associations, uh, most of which are no longer in operation. But uh, I, I, I really like the rodeos, and, and I, I like disseminating information. I love teaching, and by building a website like this, it's a good way to teach people not only what gay rodeo is about, but to get the information out there. I get so frustrated with websites that don't have the stuff you're trying to find on it. And so I'm always trying to add anything that I think will be useful to people. Now, going back to some of the things that led up uh, to you getting interested in this, what did you do right after high school? Did you have any sort of technical job? Yeah, I did. Uh, my lifetime desire up to that point is I wanted to be a telephone installer. So I applied with the phone company, which was Ma Bell back then, and uh, I kept calling and calling and calling. Finally, they came up with a position for me. I had no idea what a shopkeeper was. They didn't tell me it was, it was a shopkeeper. So I showed up where I was supposed to show up, which was actually at a facility just about a mile south of where the Pentagon is uh, called, well, it, it was the Western Electric Manufacturing Plant. The same building is still there and is now the Pentagon Mall. But my job, along with about 12 other guys, was to process telephone equipment as it was coming in. Back then, all the equipment belonged to the phone company. And when it would come out of somebody's house or business, they would, uh, within that region, they would send it into this factory to be cleaned and refurbished and then sent back out and used again. And we had to sort this stuff as it came in and connect and, and match it to computer cards. Well, we processed an average of 14,000 telephone sets a day. When I took the position, I was told that this, is, this position was supposed to last about six months, at which point they would move you out in, into other departments. Two years later, I was still there, and I was going crazy. Because uh, this is basically not even an assembly line job. The phone would come down, the, come down or 
piles of foam would come down this little conveyor belt, you'd have to pick it up, look at the number on the bottom to determine the model, and then throw it down a specific chute that matched the, mo the, the model number and the color of the foam. The person on the other side would take that and collect four or eight of them, put them in a tray, match computer cards with them, and then send them over to Western Electric. All day long, every day, five days a week, for eight hours a day. Uh, that kind of job doesn't work well with me. I can manage it for a while, but after two years I was going crazy. I had to get out, so I left the phone company. After that, I got a series of jobs as a maintenance mechanic at, at various apartment complexes, which I also liked. That was, that was a lot of fun. Uh, well, that worked for a while, but then it kind of fell apart. And I went for several years without an actual job. But I ended up being a volunteer at the high school theater where my sister went. She, she, was a, she wasn't a drama major, but she took drama. And uh, so I was, I was a volunteer for probably three or four years. <clears throat> uh, at one point, they actually got a little bit of funding for me. As far as the county was concerned, I was a part-time clerical typist. <laughs> but I was, essentially, I was the technical director, resident technical director for this theater. I had a lot of fun, fantastic uh, teacher. His name was, uh, all of a sudden I forgot his first name, Cal, Cal no, that's, that's, that's the next guy. Uh, his last name was Mr. Jones. Uh, interestingly enough, his father was the man who wrote the book on the Hatfields and the McCoys. And his father, and, and Mr. Jones grew up on the edge of Manassas National Battlefield Park. In 1961, they held, a, that was the 100th anniversary of the first battle of Manassas, they held a reenactment, which was a catastrophe. It was so bad that the Park Service decided they would never have any more reenactments in a park. So now if you go to a park, the only thing you'll see is living history. Mr. Jones was selling flyers on the, on the battlefield about the, uh, the battle. And, but the, the, the man was, he was brilliant. He, he knew theater very well. He taught me a number of things. He taught me that uh, we put on, uh, let me approach that in a slightly different manner. Uh, the purpose of, of this department was to teach kids theater. I have never heard of or seen before or since any theater, high school theater that was run the way this one was. The kids did everything and they learn how theater works. They, I mean, they did everything, including vacuuming the floors and polishing the, the, the tile. Uh, that, that theater put on about 40 plays each year. All the students had to put on plays. When, when the student reached the point of being, I think it was not senior, but the year before, the, the, the third year, the students had to produce an entire play on paper from the beginning to the end, including going out to Home Depot and finding out how much the blimber was going to cost, uh, design their costumes, all the shooting plans, uh, blocking everything in every department in the theater, make their own costumes, everything. They, they had to do the whole works. They learned a lot. And the seniors actually produced their plays. We only had, we had like five or six senior plays that occurred each year. But the way they made it all work was they put on one or two musicals a year. That made the money because it was guaranteed to sell the house out. And uh, the money we made off of that not only paid for the students' projects, but while the, the several years I was there, we built a 20-foot long control console and control room that at that time was worth about $20,000. And all of this came from the students' work. 
So we had a professional theater that was run there. Uh, I have since learned that Mr. Jones eventually became a priest of some sort, and uh, he passed away about 10 years ago someplace in California. I, I found that off of a website someplace. Now, um, did you know when you were a kid that you were gay? Not really. I first began to have some feelings. Let me talk about what I did earlier. Uh, when I was about, I think it was probably about 12 or 13, my dad had gave me the, the talk about the birds and the bees. <clears throat> and part of that talk, he, without actually saying it, he visually gave me the clue of looking at my private parts and my face and back and forth. That if I was ever out on the street and this guy would come, and any man would come along asking to, uh, you, you know, uh, I need to stay away from him because he was mentally ill and I could catch it. That caused, I didn't, I had no clue at the time that I was gay or even, I think, I think that my sexual operation had just begun to start happening. But that kind of threw me into the bowels of the closet. And uh, the first time I ever said to somebody was in 1969. I was visiting a friend in California. And uh, while we were, I was there for two weeks. And one night I was, we were kind of joking back and forth while we were laying in the dark in the bed or in the beds, and I t told him that I'm, I'm scared that I might be gay. And he assured me that I was not. So that kind of pushed the concept that it might actually be there down. It was actually a job that I had about 1976, 70, somewhere right in that period. Uh, where I finally realized what it was. And coincidence, I, I don't believe in, in fate or anything like that, but coincidences are very interesting. For about six months, I was supposedly a maintenance mechanic, although they really wanted a janitor, at a church in Washington, D.C. This same church was the... <laughs> On Sunday afternoons, they rented their facility to the Gay Church of Washington, which is part of, I'm trying to remember what they call themselves now. It's the, it's the National Organization of Gay Churches. They have a name that I can't remember. <clears throat> My job was to come in Sunday afternoons and open the church for them. I was scared to death, especially when one of these big fat guys started chasing me around the place. Because at the time I was I was wearing a, a a khaki outfit because that was what I what I was wearing. And I guess I was uh, I, I guess I was a very attract he was very attracted to me. But he was very much overweight. He probably weighed about two hundred and fifty pounds and was no more than five feet five. So anyway, one one day when I was locking up and going out, passing the trash cans at the back of the building, I grabbed a couple of copies of that had been thrown in there of The Advocate, which was a gay newspaper, which I believe is still in operation. By the time I'd finished reading that, I had come to the conclusion, yes, I am gay. But I was still 100% in the closet because I was scared to death because even, even at that time, if you were discovered to be gay, you could be imprisoned. Uh, you could be sent to correctional facilities. So I didn't tell anybody. It wasn't until after my father died in 1983 that I actually began to come out. And oddly enough, I was, uh, I had to, I, I, I ended up having to move apartments. And I couldn't really quite afford the apartment that I got 
which was the only thing I, I only had three days to get out of the apartment that I had, but that's a totally different story. That I couldn't quite afford it, so I put an ad in the advocate for a roommate. Well, I eventually got a roommate, which took care of the, the financial problems. But I also got a telephone call from this guy by the name of Tom. He didn't want a roommate, but we got together. And after about three or four weeks, we became very much attracted to each other. And after about a month or so, I, I, I realized that I was falling in love. So we had been together ever since. We actually moved in together less than a year after that uh, and been living together. Well, it's, it's, it's been 34 years. It, it will be 34 years next week. And was Tom out at the time? Tom was not out. Uh, he was in the Army. And this was even before Don't Ask, Don't Tell. So you did not come out in the Army. Uh, after a few months of us being together, I, Tom had reached the point of possible retirement. And I convinced him, you've got to get out, because if anybody, I, we were both pretty sure that a lot of the people realized he was gay. But if anybody had decided to push the issue, he would have been out and completely lost all his retirement, 20, 20 years worth of work because that's the way things were then. You get kicked out of the army. because He was easy to get kicked out of the military if you were gay. All somebody had to do was point at you and say, you're gay, and you're gone, and you lose everything. So he retired. A few weeks later, he went to work for a, for a private contractor, pretty much doing the same thing he was doing in the army. <laughs> and he worked for that company for uh, about 23 years before he finally retired from that. So we're pretty well set. And you were still in Virginia. Yeah, we were still in Virginia at this time. It was a number of years after that. I don't. I, 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 I've lost track of a lot of the dates. And I'm not good at that, so I'd have to sit down and try to calculate exactly what it was. But uh, he he was retired for about three years before we moved out here. So that would have probably been about 2008 or nine, somewhere right in there. And uh, were your siblings still in contact with you? Um, I am pretty close to one of my siblings. Uh, she lives in Florida. We're both interested mu much in many of the same things as far as uh, technical stuff is concerned. I am not particularly close, but I'm connected to my oldest brother. Uh, the younger brother, we talk about, uh, my sister and myself talk about him a lot, but I don't hear from him very often. Uh, he's, he's actually a network administrator in, uh, in a, um, a, a, a naval base. Uh, my youngest sister, none of the rest of us care. We, don't, we, we all dislike her very much. <laughs> she was the spoiled brat of the family. And uh, so, we don't know where we really don't know where she is or what she's doing. We know she's married. She has a couple of kids, but uh, I, I have no clue and I have no interest in finding out about her. But but my oldest sister, which is the oldest sister, which is nine years younger than I am, uh, we communicate frequently, and she comes to visit fairly often. So we're 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 close. And during the 1980s, when you're sort of coming out and, you know, finding a partner and mm -hmm. moving in together, um, what was it like living in Virginia at that time? In reference to being gay or, okay, uh, I didn't talk too much about it. Uh, the, the people that I worked with at the time before the park. Uh, I don't know if they had any clue I was gay or not, but it wasn't discussed. So there was, basically I was in the closet during that period. Uh, when I actually, I guess you could say, came out of the closet in a, a, in a permanent and major aspect was, uh, let me start the story at this point. In 1991, 
we found out that I had, I had full-blown AIDS. The doctors gave me six months to live. I'm still here. Well, at, at the time, that was the normal life expectancy of someone who was in my condition. I managed to make it through. Uh, thankfully, the drugs, the, the protease inhibitor drugs came out just in time to save me. Uh, however, when I started volunteering at Manassas Battlefield, after I'd been there for maybe six or eight months, uh, some lady, came, she wasn't an employee of the park. She was somebody that came in as a special purpose. But she came in with a, with a flu, which I caught. I was in bed close to dying for about a month. Uh, it really hit me hard. And um, I had, I didn't feel it was right for the, my, my boss ladies not to understand what my situation was and that I could be gone at any moment. So when I had recovered enough so that I could move around, I went in and uh, I said, we've got to talk. And that was probably the, the most difficult talk I think I've ever had. They were very accepting. They had no problems with it, uh, which made everything easy. And from that point on, I didn't blurt out about being gay or all of that stuff, but they knew that Tom was my partner, and uh, uh, they knew that I went to gay rodeos and you know the, ho the, whole, the whole kit and caboodle, uh, to use an old-fashioned term. Um, but they had no problems with it at all, so that made my life much easier. One short little clip that I think is probably the, the funniest thing that I had happen while I was at the park. My office was just off of the reception area for the headquarters building, and the the assistant superintendent lady was out in the the reception area talking to the other people about putting together the Christmas party, and she made the comment, "Fruit, we've got to get some fruit." That triggered my mind. I jumped out of my office and said, I'm here. <laughs> she turned beet red. And everybody else couldn't stop laughing. Uh, that, that's probably the most blatant mm -hmm. thing that I ever did like that. But over the years, I have become more and more open and uh, especially the last four or five years, things have become much more relaxed about gay people. So I've become more and more relaxed in my presentation and, and my being out in the world. I never had the coming out experience that is talked about so much today because I just sort of seeped out over a period of many years. So it didn't happen. It, it it didn't happen that way to me, and it wasn't something that I had to sit down with the people and say I'm gay. It didn't happen that way. Uh, everybody pretty well understood it. And when did you and Tom start traveling again? Mm. Well, we've actually been traveling ever since 1988. Um, we bought our first travel trailer. <coughs> which was in 1988, and uh, we did some camping. <clears throat> and uh, in 89, we, Tom took a, a two-year sabbatical from his job. We sold the houses that, that we had, and we lived in our travel trailer for two years. The only real reason we quit, well, there were two reasons we quit. One is because at that time, <clears throat> If you sold property, you had to put the money back into more property within two years, or you could lose a huge bunch in taxes. That's I don't think that's a problem any longer. Uh, the other one was we saw all the great scenes and the great one one of our <clears throat> one of our goals during that trip was to visit as many of the national parks as we could get to, and altogether we've been to about 300 of the national parks. When you go to the edge of the Grand Canyon and you look over the edge and say, oh, that's nice, 
you've been you you have reached the point of where you're saturated mm -hmm. and that's when we said okay it's you know we need we need to cut this out and and go back to work for a while but we have continued to travel on short trips since then <clears throat> the longest trip we've had since that was six, six months and that was <clears throat> just before us leaving northern virginia and moving to colorado so when did you start working at Manassas? Oh, I actually have that data someplace. I have to look up this precise date. <clears throat> it was around, <clears throat> let's see, 1991, we found out I had AIDS. I didn't do anything for a year. So uh, probably about 1993, the middle of 1993, <clears throat> Let me start this sentence in another, this paragraph in another spot. <clears throat> While we were traveling and visiting all these national parks, we learned of a facility that the National Park Service has called Harpers Ferry Center. You've heard of that. Uh, Harpers Ferry Center is the is sort of the communications hub. They, all the brochures you see at the parks are produced there. Uh, many of the books the films and slideshows and whatever you see at the parks, many of those are produced at Harpers Ferry Center. <clears throat> and me being an AV nut, I said that would be a wonderful place to volunteer. So I volunteered at Manassas, at uh, Harpers Ferry Center for about a year. I was in their AV department. Most of what I did was copy VHS tapes. At the, at the time, that was the best technology. And most of the parks had TV sets that their little local presentation, whatever it was, would be played from these VHS tapes. Of course, VHS tapes would wear out, so they had to be replaced on a regular basis. So my job was to pull the master, make three or four copies, and send them to the park. The AV department didn't really know what to do with a volunteer. They'd never had one before. So after about a year, they kind of ran out of stuff for me to do. So I uh, kind of faded away from that because it was a 100 mile round trip to get up there. <clears throat> um, curvy back roads. Uh, and that, you know, I still needed something to do. So <clears throat> that's when I applied at Manassas. So 91, 92, 93, so probably about 1994. <clears throat> I actually have that date recorded someplace, but I would have to go look it up. But that's approximate. And <clears throat> was the was your volunteer position full time, part time? <laughs> well, it was supposed to be just come in occasionally, but before it ended, <clears throat> in the slightly more than six years I was there, I put in more than 6,000 hours worth of time. Uh, I don't generally make too big a deal of it, but Tom likes to. When I was probably at about 4,500 hours, the superintendent wanted to do something nice for me. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't find out about it until the presentation actually occurs, but he managed to get me. I, I'm an official honorary National Park Ranger. That's the highest award the National Park Service can give. Uh, at the time, and, and, and I got that because of the work that I had done, not only on the website, but on all the computer support that I had given them. Uh, at the time that I got the award, there had only been about 160, maybe 120 people who had received it. Uh, such people as uh, John F. Kennedy, Lady Bird Johnson, uh, Queen Elizabeth, uh, Arthur Fiedler, people like that. I, I honestly believe that there's been a lot more of these given out since then, but I think that I was the first non-famous person to ever receive the award, which is, <laughs> I'm kind of kind of glad of. But uh, uh, that that was the biggest thing that came out of that operation. I didn't know they were going to give it to me, and uh, they told me to come over to the other building. <clears throat> And Tom was there, and here the the uh, head of the National Park Service was there to give me my award. So uh, it was kind of it was kind of a surprise. 
It was kind of funny, too. I have, they gave me, as part of the operation, one of the park hats. For, it's, a, it's a Stetson, and it's made out of uh, high-quality beaver felt, uh, beaver and rabbit felt. It doesn't fit me. It's too big for my head. Um, they didn't know what my hat size was. So while I was out of the office, one of the ladies went into my office and my, I had left my hat in the office and they picked it up and they, they got the measurement for that. Trouble was that day I, I had grabbed the wrong hat. The hat was too big for me. <laughs> so the Park Service hat doesn't fit very well. But it, it hangs in my study today. Uh, but that, that, was, that was an interesting experience. Something that has just come to mind, <clears throat> jumping back a few years to the late 1970s, I was a volunteer firefighter for about three years. Enjoyed that very much. Uh, one of my first gay sexual experiences, <clears throat> if you want to call it that, was not really that. One day, I was coming through the equipment bay where, where all the equipment is, is stored. I was just going from point A to point B, and I was confronted by one of the other volunteers. This was a station that was a volunteer station in, in McLean, Virginia, which is still there. Uh, they had a minimum contingent of paid personnel, <clears throat> but it was mostly volunteers. And this volunteer confronted me. Uh, in a way. He was a, an ex-Marine, bulky, handsome, gorgeous guy. He was there in a t-shirt and bunker pants. And he, he just picked up a conversation and started talking about how he'd gotten up early that morning and he hadn't had a chance to shower and uh, he had had to go out on call after call and he was sweaty and hot and um, here this this good looking gorgeous guy in rubber boots and fireman gear I was so incredibly naive I had no clue what he was trying to do it was some years later before I realized he was trying to get me to pick him up and when I stopped and thought further about it years later I realized that there was nobody else in the equipment bay, which was extremely unusual. So this was a setup to see if I would bite. But like I say, I was naive. I didn't know what he was doing, and I was still deeply in the closet. So after about 10 minutes of him trying to get me to take him on, uh, I finally said, well, I need to get back to work, and I left. But I really didn't understand he was trying to get me to get me to, to do him, if you, if you want to call it that. Uh, thinking back on it, if I had understood and taken him up on it, I would have probably become a sex slut. Because <laughs> that was exactly the sort of, sort of guys that I was into. And I realize now that everybody in the station knew. Um, you were saying you could have become a sex yeah, slut. Yeah, I, I would have. Bec I would have become a, a sex slut because that's exactly the kind of guys I was into. In another way, I'm s I'm glad that I didn't fall for it because if I had, I would have acquired AIDS much earlier than I would have, than I did, and I wouldn't be here now. So, sad part, happy part. But that was the first time anybody had ever done anything like that to, towards me. And I didn't know what they was doing. <laughs> what was it like, um, first, like, prior to, to getting AIDS, to sort of live during that, that crisis and then once you were diagnosed? Well, to be, to be honest, I didn't know there was a such a thing. Uh, because at the time, it wasn't talked about a whole lot. And when it was talked about, it was just something those, those, those queers over in California were getting. Uh, I quit reading newspapers about 1973 because uh, I, I subscribed to the newspaper and I began to realize that 
the newspapers had been turned towards sensationalism, and that's not what I was interested in. So I didn't pay any attention to newspapers. I didn't pay attention to the news and stuff like that. So I really didn't know there was anything such as AIDS, uh, much less how it was spread. When I began to, th to understand, hey, this is what's there, uh, I went basically went monogamous. It was about six years later I found out that I had already been infected. And at the time, I had only had about 15 sexual partners. Tom does not have it. So you can be in a long-term relationship without getting it from somebody who has it. But I didn't know I had it. I didn't, didn't realize it until I had gotten to, so sick to the, to the point where I was hospitalized before we found out what it was. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of other people are in the same boat. So unlike most other diseases, when you first acquire AIDS, let me say when you first acquire HIV, which is not quite the same thing, um, you, your first sickness is something like a flu. Then it can, will, will generally go into re remission and it can be up to seven years before it finally gets to you. Now this is, of course, before we had the drugs that we have now. So most of the people who got it in the early days, they, most of them didn't know they had it. And uh, it took a number of years. The problem with it is that because of the way the AIDS attacks the specific T4 lymphocyte, your body fights it off, but it continues to attack, and it takes a while for the body's immune system to run down. And that's when you actually get full-blown AIDS, is when the body just can't keep up with it anymore. It's worn itself out. Luckily, we now have the medications that if, if someone uses them properly, then you can take care of the virus it doesn't run your system down. Uh, I, my T4 count was actually at zero for a little over two years, which is why it's amazing I'm still here. Once the meds came out that, that, were, that were useful, uh, my body has spent the last 20 years trying to recover from that. I'm, my T count now is about 650, but that's as high as it'll go. If I get sick, it won't go any higher than that. So if I get something really bad, it will kill me. So we're constantly trying to be careful on that point. Uh, and I know for certain that I have never given it to anybody else because I don't, I, once I found I had it, I don't do anything that could cause anybody else to get it. But at any rate, um, I, f I, I count myself extremely lucky that I'm here, and I'm glad I'm here because I think that I've been able to help a lot of people in a lot of respects uh, between my websites and my photography. And as a person living with AIDS, did you ever experience any discrimination or...? Interestingly enough, no. I was afraid of dis discrimination. But as I said earlier, the, 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 the first time I truly came out with somebody, the fact that I had AIDS, they were very accepting, and it didn't have a problem. Uh, I have, I don't think I have ever actually experienced any discrimination because of either my sexual orientation or my health condition. At least not that I'm, I am aware of or can remember happening. So I guess I'm, I'm lucky in that respect also. Uh, I know a lot of people did, but partly because of the fact that I kept it in the closet, I think was one of the main reasons why I didn't uh, didn't experience any anything like that. And by the time I actually started coming out, it had reached the point to where gay people weren't as looked frowned upon as it was earlier. Um. So as you start to go to gay rodeos and you know spaces where people are, are more out, did you see any um, sort of homophobic incidents at any of the? Personally, I didn't actually see any, but I've heard quite a few of them. Um, I think the biggest, 
it's kind of a slightly funny story. I didn't actually see it myself, but it occurred. Uh, the first Florida rodeo, which I can't remember the year, I'd have to look it up. There was a small group of protesters out on the side, sidewalk of the, of the street that were protesting gay rodeo. These were military people. The Florida rodeo was in the summer, it was hot. Uh, the rodeo people were taking bottles of water and stacks out to these protesters. They didn't come back the next day. <laughs> but they, they, they were discriminating against gay. Uh, but like I said, I didn't see the incident, but it occurred there. I don't think that I have actually seen any homophobic situations within the area the rodeos were taking place. I have certainly seen some on TV and, and YouTube and places like that. Uh, I tend to turn them off as soon as I see them because I'm not interested in, in, in getting frustrated with somebody's personal problems. Uh, so I, I think I've been pretty good in not experiencing any of that myself. And I guess if I did, I would probably tune it out. Uh, what about, I mean, you're sort of in a unique position as webmaster. You're sort of helping, um, you know, get a lot of this information out there. Have you had any sort of um, digital connections with people who are upset about gay rodeo? <laughs> Not with the rodeo. Uh, my website, cowboyfrank.net, has been in operation since before I got involved with the, with the gay rodeos. And all that time, I have received two nasty emails. Out of the tens of thousands of emails that I've gotten, I've only gotten two nasty ones. Uh, one of them, I actually wrote a uh, little piece on, which is on the website. It, he, he was complaining about me being a, how dare you call yourself a gay cowboy. And uh, cowboys don't carry pride flags, they carry guns, etc., etc. You know, he was just ranting on. And uh, basically, I, my, my, little, my little blog, if you want to call it that, although when I wrote it, the term didn't exist. Uh, pointed out the, the places where he was <clears throat> wrong. There are a lot of gay cowboys. There always have been. Uh, and at the time, I actually owned a gun. It was a, I never used it. I just simply owned it because it, it, was, a, it was a Colt 45. Uh, I, used it, I used it a few times during Halloween, and that was not firing, but in a holster. <clears throat> and uh, there was an interesting response after I had posted this thing. A real cowboy wrote me. He said he wasn't gay, but he had lots of gay cowboy friends. And he actually made me feel very good because he ended his little speech with something like, you may not be a real cowboy, but you certainly act it. That's not exactly what he said. What he said was much better than that. It's on my website. I can't remember exactly how he phrased it. But it made me feel very warm inside. Uh, the other negative email I got, I deleted immediately. So I don't even remember. I didn't even finish reading it, so I don't remember what it was about. But that one, and that's all. I've not gotten anything negative. The emails that I have gotten that you might consider to be partially negative weren't really. They said that they don't agree with the lifestyle. They used the term. Uh, but they didn't complain either. Several of them asked specific questions, not about gay, but about cowboys. And several of the others just simply said, good luck to you. And uh, so I've, I've re received almost no hate mail at all, which I don't know if that has anything to do with the timing or the way that my website is put together. Hard to tell. And what do you think it was about the gay rodeos that, you know, sort of kept you coming back? Oh, the com camaraderie, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, we're one big happy family. I had been to not a whole lot, but a few 
straight rodeos. They are nothing like ours as far as friendship is concerned. Uh, all of the straight rodeos that I have either been involved in or watched either on TV or YouTube, that is a massive competition against the other guy. There is no way that a straight rodeo cowboy will actually advise another contestant as to methods of improving because they might beat me. 100% <clears throat> different in the gay rodeo. The, I think one of our contestants who passed away from ovarian cancer a few years ago, I think put it very well. Uh, Ty Tigan said, I want you to do good. I will loan you my horses. I will loan you my, my equipment. I will tell you how to do better <clears throat> so that you can go out there and do the best you can, and then I'm going to go out and beat you. <laughs> that's that's the, the feeling between most of us. We would rather see the other guy do a good job than for us to beat them. Because we're all trying. This is this is a serious competitor co competition. But that that is one of the things that I don't see any in in hardly any other sporting event of any sort uh, is that kind of family. Uh, we love going to the rodeos because we see our friends that we haven't seen in a while. Uh, I first I, I first got in, interested in coming to the rodeos because it was it was a fun event to come to, and at least in the earlier days you don't see it quite as much now. The eye candy is terrific, <laughs> especially in the stands. Florida, when they were when they were going, they had some of the the most hunky shirtless guys there <laughs> you could find because their rodeo was held in Fort Lauderdale, just outside of Fort Lauderdale. And Fort Lauderdale is a big bustle beach area. So the, the muscle boys would, would come out and uh, it was wonderful eye candy. <laughs> uh, some of the others were too. Uh, so that, that, that was a good draw. Uh, when we were running the Atlantic States uh, out of Washington, D.C., when, when our rodeos were going, we were famous for our parties. We would have an average of, of around between two to four thousand people, half of which would go to the rodeo. Well, some would go to both the rodeo and the party, but then you'd have a lot of people that just went to the party and a lot of people who just went to the rodeo. And our dances were incredible. You you would get three hundred people on 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 the floor all doing a line dance. <laughs> Nothing quite as exciting as watching something like that, or, or uh, I, I'm not sure what you call it because I don't dance, but where two people are holding on to each other and spinning in circles around the floor. Uh, 250 people all out in a big pile doing this, trying not to run into each other and still having a great deal of fun. Uh, it used to be in, in some of the, some of the earlier. Atlantic States rodeos when I first began to go to the parties when I got involved with the association. Everybody wore their best outfits. They would go out and buy new outfits just to, to it was like going to a black tie party. Uh, just gorgeous outfits, both the ladies and the guys. And you find the ladies dancing with the guys and vice versa. Uh, that is really what it, uh, other than the, just simply going to the rodeo, enjoying the cowboys riding their horses, because I've always loved cowboys on horses, seeing the, 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 the people and seeing how they interact in a big family environment, which you don't find hardly any kind of other organization. I'm, I'm sure there are some types of events out there that have that kind of connection, but I've never seen any. So that's, that's the reason I keep coming. And now I have reached the point, I would, I would love to, to, I'm not going to compete anymore, I'm, I'm past that capability, but I would love to like be a rodeo judge 
But then I think so many people rely on my photography now, they would hate me if, mm -hmm. if I didn't <laughs> shoot pictures instead. <laughs> and I enjoy shooting the pictures, so that's so I, I stick with that. And I think I do a fairly good job of it. And what did you use to compete in? Uh, I started out, once, once I had met my, f my friends in, uh, in Virginia, I started out barrel racing. I, uh, I spent about a year and a half learning the barrel race uh, under the t uh, tutelage of a very good barrel, barrel racing instructor. I admit I've never been very good at it. Um, but after, after the year and a half, I finally uh, tried competing. I t my, my partner Tom did not want me to compete because he was afraid I was going to get hurt. The one time I tried competing in barrel racing, I got hurt. So they put an end to that. I didn't make a score. I, this was this was in Washington, uh, D.C., and uh, I didn't have enough practice with the horse I was riding. And when he went around the first barrel, he decided he wanted to leave. And I was so tight and worried that I let him. The second day, I said, I'm not going to let him do that. So we went around the first barrel, and he started to go that way, and I started pulling him back. And I got him pointed towards the second barrel, and then two things happened. I lost my left stirrup. And the arena crew was standing right smack in front of me. Now, they, they were against the fence, but where I was headed, I didn't have proper control of my horse, and I was heading right for them. So I lost it, and the horse turned and went out. And in the process of going out, I'm not sure exactly what I did wrong, but he ended up running into the fence. The whole this was a chain link, like an, a, an eight foot chain link fence. The whole fence fell down on its side, and because of the way it was constructed, it pushed us back up. And I came off and landed on the dirt, and he wandered off and started grazing on the grass. <laughs> but. It wasn't a serious injury. It just pulled a muscle in my in my arm, but that was enough for that. So that ended my barrel racing. Uh, after that, I took a few lessons and I competed in what we call calf roping on foot, which is a uh, fairly simple little event to throw the rope. And I've got a couple of ribbons. I got I got a couple of uh, fourth place ribbons. Actually, the first time I caught was in Chicago, and uh, that was the first time I was actually doing the competition. And I caught on Sunday, and I was so surprised at the fact that I actually got it that I forgot to let go of the rope, which got pulled out of my hand. And because I forgot to let go of the rope, I ended up in fourth place instead of first place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that diff You're only talking about two-tenths of a second, but that was enough to throw me out of, of winning the first place for Sunday. But I got my two ribbons, and that made me happy. And uh, now my arthritis is the point that I can't hold, I can't control the rope anymore. So uh, I just do the behind-the-scenes stuff. But and when you were barrel racing, uh, did you have your own horse, or did you? I never actually owned a horse. Thought about it a couple of times and decided that horses require a lot of maintenance and they're very expensive to take care of. And I didn't have a proper property to take care of. And I decided that if I was going to own a horse, I wouldn't be boarding at some place where I'd only go see the horse once a week or something like that. So it was, it would, we would have to have lived in a place where I could have the horse there. Now some of the other people who lived in the area did have horses. At least they had had them when their children were growing up. But our property wasn't conducive to, to it, so uh, I was content to ride other people's horses, and as long as they were content to let me, it was fine. Terry, the guy I was talking about that uh, got me involved in the rodeo, uh, he has had and still has a farm up in the mountains of Virginia. And uh, when I went out there to do the to, to ride the first few times, I guess I'd probably about the third ride when we'd finished it, I asked him if he would teach me how to tack up the horse, which apparently floored him because he'd taken hundreds of people for rides, but nobody ever asked to be taught how to do it. And so we became very good friends. 
and after I had been taking lessons for quite a while, he he. And, and got to where I knew what I was doing on a horse. He basically said, you can come up any time you want, even if we're not here, and take the horses out on a ride. So I did that probably about seven or eight times before we ended up moving out of the area. Uh, I, I, I just absolutely love horses. They, they are extremely intelligent. And uh, I believe that most animals, at least the higher animals, are just as intelligent as we are. What we have that they lack is our incredibly complex language. I point to one of the horses that I used to ride, poor Sam, he's, I'm sure he's, he's long gone now, but this horse was smart. He figured out, you know, a lot of horses will figure out how to open their stall gates. I don't know what you call it, but they have these little, um, things on the end of, of, of cords and stuff that you have to pull the little lever down in order to slide the little thing so you can get it on. He figured out how to open those. And he would let the other horses out of the stalls. Uh, Terry ended up putting padlocks on there because <laughs> Sam kept letting them out of everything <laughs> else. But it, when you look at our civilization, this is totally off on a separate, separate subject, but when you look at our civilization, I ask people, what, what makes us better than the other, other animals? And the first thing most people point to is our opposable thumbs. But I look at them and then say, why isn't the raccoon? There are lots of other animals that have opposing thumbs. There are other animals that have bigger brains than we do. It's our language. I've got a little blog on my website that says that horses in nature have about 160 words in their language. It's mostly visual clues. Most of those are involved in day-to-day -day living, like I'm hungry, or I'm scared, or help me, or something like that, or get away, or leave me alone. Our civilization couldn't exist if we only had 160 words to work with. That's what makes the difference between us and the other animals, is our ability to communicate in extremely complicated fashion and get the, the technologies and everything we have and everything we do is built on what previous people have discovered and we keep discovering. Without our language, that wouldn't be possible. That's the difference. What do you say to, um, you know, I know there's been groups like PETA mm -hmm. that have protested rodeo is cruel to animals. You know, most of the time that I, I have seen a few PETA, um, um, what's it called, uh, where they're standing out there protesting. Usually, they're not there the next day. The biggest problem seems to be that the people who actually go out representing these organizations, they don't really know what they're protesting. None of them have bothered to go look. They're just simply taking the word of somebody else. We have very little trouble with those organizations now because I think they have finally realized that we treat our animals very well. There are still a lot of anti-rodeo stuff out there uh, and anti-gay rodeo stuff out there, primarily from people who haven't bothered to research what they're protesting. Anytime they actually sit down and take the time to take a look at it, they realize that they're not protesting anything that's real. And as we have, we used to get, we used to get those kind of protests quite a bit back in the 1990s. Almost nowhere now, and I think that's the reason is because we. The, the, all the IGRA rodeos have to follow the IGRA rules, and we have a large number of rules that are geared specifically for, for ethical treatment of the animals. Uh, I think occasionally we do have accidents. That happens out in the field. Occasionally a cow will break a leg because it steps in a gopher hole. Uh, we have had a few animals get killed, and any time that happens, 
the hell, it, 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 the, 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 the stuff hits the fan at the next convention to try to figure out what happened and how to keep it from happening again. So I don't think that we have had a single incident that was caused because of a repeat of something that happened before. It's always something new. And can you describe sort of some of the, the duties you now have, the, the photographs you take and things like that, and your main form of involvement? <coughs> Uh, well, besides being the webmaster for the International Association, which means that I have to keep up with everything that's going on and keep the website updated, and design the website from scratch, which I did a few years ago, uh, the non-official, basically I'm the unofficial, unofficial or non-official, which is <laughs> what's proper, uh, photographer for, for the gay radios. Um, in Whatever year it was that Brokeback Mountain won the Academy Award, that was kind of an interesting period for me. Between the time that the awards were announced and the time that they actually presented, I received several hundred telephone calls from news media all around the world wanting to know about Gay Rodeo because my phone number was the only one on the website. <laughs> It was there because if, if an emergency problem came up, I had it there so that people could call me and tell me there was something that needed to be fixed. But mine was the only number there, so I was the one getting all these phone calls. After about a month, I managed to talk to the president into letting me put his number on there, and that <laughs> quit. But when these people found out that I had this huge collection of phot photographs that I've been shooting for 15 years, they all wanted me to pick pictures out that they could use in their whatever their TV show or magazine or newspaper, whatever it was, and send them. I had about 30,000 pictures at that time. Trying to go through those and pick good ones was a nightmare. So what I did was I developed a little pr private website, I call it the private website, where I take every single picture that I've ever shot at a gay rodeo and run it through a little program which generates a gallery. And all I have to do is point to people at that, pic at that, at that gallery, go pick what you're, whatever you want, just give me credit. And uh, so you will see my pictures popping up all over the place. And that's, that's where they're coming from. And the, the newspaper can go to, to that website, not only see a gallery of the pictures I've got, but they can get the original camera image from that location too. And it's all, all the instructions are right there. It's pretty straightforward. So that really, creating that really kind of changed people's outlook on, on what I can do or what I have made available. And now in the last few years, I've started doing videos and putting them on YouTube. And I think the contestants really like that because I've, I've had so many compliments or comments that they like that because they can go and they can study what they did wrong and try to improve <laughs> on it. You can't, you can't really see what you did wrong from a still picture unless you fell or something like that. But the video, uh, we had one fellow, boy I felt sorry for him, I'm not going to say who it was, at one of the rodeos, when he went around the first barrel, he did something wrong, and I'm not going to say what that was either, although I was able to take the video and slow it way down so he could see what he did wrong. And the horse ended up flipping head over heels. Luckily, neither one of them were injured except in the mind. Uh, but he was able to figure out what he did wrong and keep from doing it again, and that would have been impossible otherwise. So when you're on the back of the horse, you can't, unless you're really, really, really good at what you're doing, most of the time you don't know what you did wrong. Now, I know, uh, like in the 80s and early 90s, you had to be really careful about taking pictures because um, not everyone was out. Do you yeah. still experience any of that? That problem went away. It, it, it actually occurred at a specific rodeo. Um, we, had a, we had a rule that said that the contestants could requ request a no photo request and it would be announced to be the, by the announcer. Trouble is you can't enforce that really. 
because you've got to, especially since cell phones have started all having cameras in them. Uh, we had a situation at one of the rodeos where there was a group of people that were protesting something. They were, they were our own contestants. They were protesting something which I'm not going to get into. And their protest, this particular year, we had a commercial company that came in and actually videoed, made full uh, ESPN style, although not quality, uh, presentations of, of 10 of our rodeos. And uh, those videos are now available on, on our YouTube website. Uh, but this particular group of people were protesting something else. And as their protest, they said, we're not going to compete as long as those cameras are turned on, which created some massive problems. So after that rodeo, uh, the president repealed the no photo request. I uh, fully understand why we had the no photo request, because when it was first put in way back in the beginning, a lot of these peoples were in positions where they could not afford to be known. Uh, at the time that the, the no photo request was removed, I think we lost three contestants. Now they, they were in positions where they couldn't afford this. Like one of them was in the military. This was still during Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Uh, so I understand and I feel sorry for them. But we only lost about three. All the others were open enough that they don't care. And you've also acted um, sort of in your capacity as webmaster, but also in a sort of archival um, oh, role yeah. of creating um, the, the history website. Yeah, that, that was kind of an interesting situation in itself. Back when I first started doing the website for Atlantic States, one of the first things I tried to do, and it took me several years to accomplish it, was to get copies of all of their previous programs published on the website. I dreamed of being able to do the same thing about all the gay rodeos. But at that time, I lived in Virginia, and the archives, I had no idea what the archives consisted of at the time, was in Colorado. So, and so I didn't have the opportunity to be able to connect it with it. All of a sudden, I live in Colorado. And that same year, the position of the IGRA archivist changed to a, a, another particular person who incidentally is back with it right now as we speak, uh, Brian Rogers. He learned about our house, where it was located, and that we've got this big cellar. And at that time, the archives were being stored in the basement of Charlie's Bar, or some of it was in the basement of Charlie's Bar, which flooded. And some of it was here at the rodeo grounds in a, uh, in a storage container, which could be 150 degrees in the summertime and well below zero, not to mention the dirt and dust from, from the rodeo equipment that was there. Not a good place. So Brian convinced Tom and myself to at least temporarily store the archives in our basement. Whoa, <laughs> there's all the stuff I wanted to work with for all these years right there in the house. So that's how that came into being with the GayRodeoHistory.org website. Uh, and it, it continues to grow. I'm, I'm actually a little frustrated with it right at the moment because I need help and I can't get any. So it's, uh, it's kind of the, the further development is kind of in limbo at the moment because I'm, I, have, I have already uh, cataloged and posted a lot of material that is currently sitting on a table waiting to be sorted and stored. And I have to, it has to be inventoried as it's being stored and I can't do it myself. I, I have a problem with dyslexia. And if I'm looking at a computer and trying to put information in and then I have to go over here and, and handle the physical product, I get mixed up. And so I, it, it's, it's too much, it's too hard for me to do both those jobs and I can't get anybody at the moment to come out and help me. I keep hoping and keep, people keep promising, but so far nothing's happened. So 
And that's a, you know, not a, a, a small amount of things. It's no, it's thousands. not. Yes. Uh, the This year, the San Francisco Rodeo, I keep calling it San Francisco because that's the nearest large town, will be our 500th gay rodeo. So we don't have all 500 programs, but we've got about 480 of them. The archives has now grown with hundreds of pamphlets, newspaper articles, magazine articles. We even have clothing, t-shirts, jackets, hundreds and hundreds of contestant pass badges, badge passes, uh, pins. Since I've started creating the Gay Rodeo History website, the amount of material that was in the archives when I took it over has quadrupled. It is a huge project, not as big as a library, but it's still huge, and it's one person trying to do the whole thing. It's too much. So it, it kind of takes away, you, loo you lose interest after a while, and you, it's hard to get going when, when you can't get anybody to, to help you out. I'm hoping that's going to change. Now, for you, why is it, why has it been worth, you know, hundreds of thousands of man hours to, to do this? What, what do you hope preserving this history mm. will create? I think it all comes back to education. Uh, I very much, I like collections, I like collecting things. Uh, my current major collection is computers. <laughs> but, um, I also like teaching, and building a website or an informative website is one way that I can teach a lot of people without going to a whole lot of effort compared to what it would be if I had to have classes. And in a class, you can teach maybe 15 or 20 or 30 people at a time. The website can teach thousands of people uh, with one effort. So I really enjoy making this information available to the public. I also get pride in, I see so many newspaper articles. There was one in the Washington Post a couple of days ago. Uh, and stories and other, other things that are coming out of the information that I have on the history website. Uh, a lot of times I can read a, a newspaper article or a magazine article and I can see what is almost a quote of some of the stuff that's on the website. So it's a way of educating the world about what we do, why we're here, what we're trying to do. And uh, it's a way without having to go out and contact individual people to do it. So it's a different way of, of teaching. And I love it. I love helping people, and I love teaching people. So this is this is one way I can do that. Now you touched on this earlier when you were saying that that this younger generation didn't grow up with cowboys. Um, obviously, there's been a, a sort of decline in membership. Mm -hmm. What do you think the future of IGRA is? I think in the in the future, I think that uh, gay rodeo will be around for a long time because there is enough core members who who have this lifestyle as part of their life. They're dedicated. I was just looking at, a, at Google Earth this morning <clears throat> of one of our competitors' homes. The whole thing is geared around rodeo. <laughs> you just look at it from the sky and you see there's nothing there except a house and rodeo. So there are enough of us around that they, that, that Gay rodeo will continue for quite a few years. I think the, there's no one reason why we're fading. There's a whole slew of reasons, and they're all coming together at the same time. One of them is that the core people who created gay rodeo grew up in the 1950s and 60s when cowboy TV shows and cowboy movies were all the rage. So we grew up cowboy. The current generation didn't grow up cowboy. 
So that's one thing. The people have, are losing a bit of interest. Uh, Fifteen years ago, country western dancing was all the rage. But a lot of those people have gone under, uh, either aged and gotten where they can't dance or the facilities for the dancing has faded. Uh, or they've just gotten tired. And there are new dance styles that have come in to replace that. Uh, when gay rodeo first started, especially the Reno rodeos in the 19, late 70s, at that time there was really no place that a large number of gays could get together to be in, in a public facility to be completely open. It just, they didn't exist. The best you could do would be to visit a bar or possibly be involved in, in something like a, uh, um, a uh, gay pride parade. Uh, so the dancing has, has moved away. The, uh, the cowboy being, the movies have gone away. Uh, we have become, gay people have become more accepted in, oh, I was saying that uh, there was no place to go in a large group, but the gay rodeos allowed that, so there was a, it was a congregation. Now you can go, you can walk down just about any street holding hands with, with a same-sex partner the most you might do is raise a couple of eyebrows. Back in the 70s, that wouldn't happen. You couldn't do that. So we're more accepted. We don't have to congregate the way we used to. There's a whole slew of reasons that we're fading. Uh, another reason which I believe is poor management. When gay rodeo started, the people and, and most of the individual associations got started, even the, the one that just began, the people in the base of the association were go-doers. Go uh, they were their kind of person who could go out and find people and convince them this is this is what we need to do and get the other person excited about doing it. Over the years since I first started doing websites, I have worked with a large number of nonprofits. And I've seen this same thing happen in a lot of associations. When an association gets started, you've got go doers, go getters, people who are excited about whatever the project is. They sometimes get burnt out or they serve their term and other people come in and eventually in a nonprofit, unless it's really well structured, you end up with people in charge who aren't that interested in perpetuating the purpose of the organization. They're more interested in having the power and the prestige of being the president or the, the being on the board of this association. And as a result, the association falls apart. Uh, this is different than a lot of businesses where you've got a profit margin you have to deal with and you've got investors that you have to please. Although I see the same thing happen in some businesses. But I've seen more associations fall apart because of management that doesn't have the get-go or the go get, whatever the proper phrase is there. Uh, and the association just kind of flounders and eventually dissolves away. So all of these things together is why we're seeing, I think, why we're seeing gay rodeo fade. Uh, something will probably take over in its place at some point, not as far as rodeo is concerned, but some other type of event. And after a period of time, that event will suffer the same. It's, it's, it, I think it's part of human nature, part of the operation of the way things happen. So it's not any given thing. It's a lot of different things. And for yourself, you know, your involvement and 
rodeo for 20 years yeah. now. All of your, uh, you know, the fact you've worn a cowboy hat most <laughs> of your life. Yeah. Uh, do you really identify as a cowboy? I think I do in a way. I appreciate what the what the real cowboys do, and there are still a lot of them out there. You, as as one song that I like, cowboy is still there. He just can't be seen from the road. Uh, I think being a cowboy is more than just simply working cattle and horses. It's a uh, it's a, it, it, it's a way of looking at life. And I try to uphold that as much as I can. I try to help the other person. And I try to take care of what we have to, to, to take care of. Our horses, our facilities, our organization. Uh, anything you can do that is positive towards that that's 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 my feeling on it. Well, we've talked about a lot today. Is there anything else you want to mention? Uh, I, to be very honest with you, I had been thinking about this for several weeks, and I think I've covered all the little interesting tidbits that I had thought were important to fit in. Well, thank you so much for your time. And uh, my apologies to whoever tries to transcribe this. <laughs> <laughs> That's their job.